happening. Um, so I will start and I will make a few comments and then I'll stop and ask you what you think. But let me go to the points I made at a, you know, one of those little talks on Martin Luther King Day. Um, all right, first of all, organized religion. I want you to think about this. Is it true that the contemporary church is weak and ineffectual and is often the arch defender of the status quo? Is that true? In your experience, are the church, excuse me, like social clubs that just defend uh, conservatism, the status quo, which is of course exactly not what Jesus did, right? Jesus faced, uh, you know, he got killed because he criticized the status quo, the rich, the Sadducees, and the fundamentalists, the Pharisees. So we're doing exactly what Jesus said told us not to do. So I want you all to react to that. I made about six points here. So please take note. What do you think of organized religion? Secondly, he was a radical conservative. He's trying to get people to make good on the declaration. All men are created free and equally. Um, and African Americans are, are part of America's destiny. You can't keep shoving us out. You can't keep saying, oh, it's making me uncomfortable. I don't want to talk about it. It's part of the history. Um, number three, the founding fathers were radical progressives, religious heretics, and political traitors, right? They declared war on their founders. They completely, they said that the king does not have divine right. So he's a heretic, right? They're heretics. They were Unitarians and not Trinitarians, which also makes them heretics. Uh, they were pro-enlightenment. They wanted to create a science of government. They wanted science and religion to be equally valuable, which was giving science way, way more respect than it had before, okay? That's the, the truth about it. So Martin Luther King is a progressive. He's not a radical progressive. He's, he's religiously conservative, you know? The natural law, he's, he's quoting Augustine, he's quoting Aquinas, He's quoting Socrates. I mean, how much more conservative can you get? And he's not a political traitor. He's, he's a conservative. He's wanting him to make good on their principles. Even though he was conservative, he was labeled a liberal extremist. Does that happen now, right? Do, are the conservatives really the radicals and the liberals really the conservatives? I mean, <laughs> You have to get, you know, the power of words to make you unable to see what's in front of your face is really important. So there's that. We have a natural capacity to recognize the truth in spite of the socialization, right? Blacks were obviously socialized to think of themselves as inferior, but every time a little kid is born, they look around and they can figure, I'm not stupider than the white kid, you know? Or that white kid is mean or that white kid is dumb. I mean, they're not, they can get it. And so you can't oppress people forever. They have a natural desire to be free and they know intuitively they deserve equal treatment. Um, liberal arts education is supposed to trigger your capacity and desire for intellectual honesty and commitment to truth. And so he refers to Socrates. He's completely educated in the Western tradition. Socrates wanted to create a tension in the minds, right? Examine yourself. He wanted to expose their corruption or their ignorance. Um, 
he wanted to unify reason and faith, science and religion, right? And so, okay, you all, give me a, at least a couple reactions to those aspects of the letter. Jack. I definitely think religion has turned into a social club for certain religious denominations. Like, I don't know, I don't wanna name names, but certain churches are like that for sure. I think okay. that the Republicans are pretty radical, like the Trump, the Trumpers are pretty radical. And they they want to call the other ones the radical ones. Okay, what's radical about them? Just they're not really along the Republican Party lines. They just follow what Trump says. Well, then you have to, you know, say, well, what does Trump say or what does Trump do, right? So if you, you know, if you want to make the case, you should have your evidence, right? Um, well, so what is democracy? It's the, a constitutional government, right? The rule of law, okay? So that would be one way to go is that um, did Trump, you know, respect the rule of law, right? And then there was the question of, well, there were certain social norms that presidents had respected in the past, but they weren't laws. They were just norms, what was considered normal. And so is that, you know, what about that? So anyway, I would just recommend that if you want to say that, you sort of have marshaled the evidence to say that, because obviously we're polarized. And, um, People do get their data from different places. And so I, you know, I do think if students can just sit down and, you know, have everybody gets a chance to say exactly why they think what they think, then they can understand, wait a second, we're gonna have to find out what's actually the case because everybody has a reason to think they're right their conclusions are correct, but but somehow we have to get a same this a same a sense of the same reality, right? Um, okay, but there is there definitely is in polarization. Each side is accusing the other side of what that other side thinks is true of the other side, right? <laughs> Does that make sense? And that's that's a breakdown, and that's a problem. So. Uh, anything else, Jack? Okay. What about you, Melanie? Um, kind of similar to Jack. I think in certain religions, specifically like um, Christianity and Catholicism, at least just in my experience, they're more um, very conservative and under that stereotype. Um, but like I've been to church in Colorado and also Florida um, and I can't remember what denomination my aunt falls under but it's not um, like it's not uh, Christianity or anything like that but she she does believe in God and she believes there is a God but um, it was just different like they um they would all like sing together and it would be really upbeat, um, like music. And it was just fun. Like um, they would laugh together and, you know, things like that. But I went to a Catholic school for eight years and I would go to church twice a week. And I, I just never, you know, I never liked it. I never formed that connection with it. Um, it was more of just like we would sit and we were quiet the whole time and we would pray to ourselves. And so, I don't know, it was just different. So now you're a, a humanist, huh? <laughs> okay. Yes, very much so. That works. Actually, they used to call them recovering Catholic. <laughs> that was, have you ever heard that expression? Yes. <laughs> okay, well, that's not the only denomination. Don't worry, right, Mr. Um, 
Newland was a recovering Jew, right? Yeah, it's it's nothing personal, nothing personal to that denomination. Okay, Mia, what you got? Um, I, again, I'm kind of on the same boat as them. I I'm very against organized religion. I've def I've definitely said this in class before, but I just oh, I do not like it for the simple fact of it tells they tell you how to how to worship god and how, how you have to do it and a lot of times like the ideology there it's so it's so critical to like what the like the life that jesus lived i mean he spent his time like well i'm focusing on christianity at the moment but like he spent his time with people who were considered like misfits and now like the church literally misfits and it's like why why would you do that and then um other comments i had oh and then for the like uh conservatives like liberal extremists vice versa yeah i do think that is exactly how it works but i think it's more of like people who consider themselves like republicans or conservatives in general it's like i just think that a lot of times they're not level-headed it's just, what is the most absurd that I could say for whatever reason? Cause like, I don't know, my stepdad is one of those people and he has like, he drinks out of a cup that says like liberal tears, like all of these things. And it's very, it's like the most offensive cup that you could ever, well, he's, he was my stepdad. My mom divorced that guy, but he, I don't know. It was just like, how can you, how can you support something that is so obviously hateful and just destructive to society like i don't know i just i don't get that oh and then another comment i had that was kind of it's related but not necessarily like what you went over i think this like learning about king is so interesting because to me in school i was taught like oh martin luther king was um he he was the guy that said like i had a dream and then died and i don't know I, that's literally what we learned so i did not i have not learned oh we learned about both Martin Luther King and then Martin Luther King Jr. But like, I don't know. I just like learning about both sides. I think it's interesting. So yeah, that was a lot of information. I'm sorry, but. No, no, that's not a lot. It's fine. Okay, so your education is biased. Um, yeah. Yeah, and that's worrisome, right? Because then people get this whole narrative in their heads about what's going on. And it's really, really hard to undo that narrative because it part becomes part of your life. And it, yeah, it was really bad for me because I didn't start like opening my eyes until literally last like 2021. I was an absolute like, I don't know, this is really bad. I was a very corrupt person, but like the BLM movement in the summer of 2020. What movement? I, the, the Black Lives Matter movement, you know, whenever like the protests were happening, I was so against it. Like I did not, I was not in support of it at all. And it wasn't even because like, I didn't have a reason for it. It was just that people in my town, I mean, I'm in like from the most conservative town in Texas, but like it literally or conservative town in Texas, you know, but it's just, I had no reason to hate it. And it was because I was shown one clip where a protest had turned into a riot, but it wasn't even because of people of color. It was literally a white guy. He attacked this other guy's truck just because he was attacking things, just because, and he had a trailer full of horses and his horses ended up, get, ended up dying. He uh, shot him with a flare gun. And it was just, that video was shown to me out of context. And I just like, that's all it took. And so I just think it's interesting. It's like, I don't know context is everything and then learning both sides of the story is also everything so it's like yeah okay well i do think it's important for you to see this because look it's 57 years later and all the same things happen mm -hmm. and you know how much longer are we going to have to go so um so let me talk a little bit more let me talk okay i will give you um just about all the analogies i mean it's de depressing okay all right so how many of you heard about outsiders that um there were demonstrations held in minneapolis and other portland 
and people were talking about outsiders, right? And um, so you got to watch out for that. That's a trigger button. Um, you deplore the demonstrations, but not the conditions that caused them. Does that still happen? People focus on the demonstrations and not what it is they're demonstrating about. Okay, so in a nonviolent campaign, fact gathering, do injustices exist? Are there injustices in terms of the relationship between the police officers and black men, right? How many of them get shot? How many, you know, what are the circumstances? Um, how, how does the court system work? Um, do the police officers even have to go to court? What sort of decisions are made? You know, those are the facts. There, there was a lot of fact gathering. There were negotiations, right? I mean, Blacks have tried to work with police, community policing. Um, and then, um, and then there was self-purification. Now, I don't know how many um, demons, uh, how many groups got together and tried to train people in nonviolent resistance. I know Martin Luther King really had an organized uh, group of people that were training people. So they would practice on them, right? They would. Um, uh, you know, beat, beat them up and the people had to learn not to fight back, right? They had to be conditioned so that when the time came, they wouldn't fight back, which is a survival instinct, you know, it's a trigger. Anyway, then they, they decided, well, that none of this, they took direct action, they postponed it, um, and you know it was clear nothing was going to happen. So they um, they demonstrated. The goal is negotiation, just like it is now. The goal is to get things changed. Okay. And then there's this problem of you're willing to break laws. Well, the Jim Crow laws were illegal, right? So now we have more and more states' rights, and states are passing laws that are illegal according to the federal government. Lots and lots, hundreds of state laws are being passed that might get to the Supreme Court. They might not because it costs a lot of money to pay all these lawyers to take it to the Supreme Court. And then the Supreme Court now has extremely conservative judges who dismantled affirmative action they dismantled voter protection laws. That's why we have all these voter suppression laws, hundreds of voter suppression laws. And those are because the Supreme Court dismantled a law that had been in place. Um, we also have hundred, we have all this affirmative action that no longer um, applies. And so we're getting discrimination again, right? If people on top will not give away power unless they're forced to, then, I mean, affirmative action was an effort. It never forced anybody to do anything, but it did have criteria. And um, anyway, so there's that. Uh, there's a moral responsibility. We have a moral responsibility to disobey unjust laws. You can't just let your country have unjust laws. You need to demonstrate against those laws or else you're just not going to have a democracy. You just have an authoritarian government, whatever, which is might makes right. Whatever I and my buddies can get past is the truth. Um, all right, so you have to have a higher standard. Um, yeah, and this is what Melanie pointed out. Um, the unjust law is voted in by a minority, but everyone is forced to obey it. So we have a problem now with gerrymandering. I don't know if you know about gerrymandering, uh, voter suppression laws. There's a lot of ways 
that a minority is is winning elections for lots of reasons. Um, but there's also just a plain old rhetoric where people do vote against their interests. Um, there's a there's a law that's just on the face of it, but the way it's applied. So Martin Luther King got arrested because he paraded without a permit. Well, why didn't he get a permit, right, in Birmingham? He should, there was no reason for him not to get a permit. It was racism that denied the permit. So anyway, so you have, if you're going to break it, you have to do it openly, you have to accept the penalty, and your conscience forces you. Um, then he is very upset about white moderates who care more about order. So I don't think this time, I don't remember them, there being too many white moderates saying, you know, it's too soon. <laughs> I don't, I don't, I mean, I, again, I got information, but it was not what other people got. Um, anyway, so I, there weren't big movements of white, whites who claim not to be racist, but who said you're going too soon, because <laughs> it's 57 years after Martin Luther King, and we still have all these problems. I don't think anybody said, gee, we're going too fast. Um, paternalistic, how many people are treating Black people? I don't think that happened too much either, because there are a lot of professional Black people these days. And they were the lawyers and mayors and governors and legislators. It was just much better than it was 57 years ago in that sense. There was less of this paternalism going on. Um, the tension is a phase. The trouble is it's 400 years. Like, when is this going to get over? Then this exactly happened in Black Lives Matter, that the demonstrators were accused of precipitating violence. And that is not true. And it, it was the people against them that precipitated the violence. Um, myths about time, change is not inevitable. That should be obvious. You have to fight. Um, they were accused of being extreme. It's not extreme to want Blacks to have equality. Um, it's extreme to be complacent or to, to accept that kind of inequality when you, when you are living in a democracy. That's extreme. Um, let's see. Oh, yeah, some Black people became successful and they were indifferent. Again, I don't know how many Black people were indifferent or against the Black Lives Matter. Some people are bitter. So then there were some people who were violent, I'm sure, but According to a Princeton study, 93% nonviolent, which is incredible in any kind of movement like this. It was higher than that for Martin Luther King. Um, okay, let's see. So, and then he's comparing it to the Bible, and I'll show you that in a minute. The church as a social institution, it should not be otherworldly. It should work for um, bringing heaven to earth, you know? The God created us equally, we gotta work to have our institutions fit the truth about the creation. Um, all right, so our destiny is tied up with America's destiny. All right, so this is an outline about the way I got raised, right? There is a social justice gospel tradition. There are churches. I was at a, a church this morning. My preacher was preaching about racism. She has a job to engage in racial, racial reconciliation. Her job was to set up an eight week curriculum about racism, anti-racism, and to teach every single Methodist minister in the state of Minnesota this curriculum. Part of the curriculum was for the minister to meet with people in the church, that the church is just honed in on getting every single Methodist to get with the program, okay? 
So just FYI, guys, um, there's there's stuff out there. So the Bible was used. How about the Bible? You know, it, it was used to justify slavery. It was used to justify sexism. Is that the truth about the Bible, right? The Bible needs to be looked at through the lens of natural law and other things besides just literal interpretation. The Old Testament prophets, they spoke out against injustices. They spoke out against corruption. I mean, <laughs> the, there's a prophetic tradition. If you want to read some of these things, Amos, Micah, Hosea, these are great books. They're wonderful. And especially just, you know, the culture starts to tell you what the Bible's about. But the people who tell you that didn't necessarily read it. And they didn't, they read parts they wanted to. So please don't, once you're in college, don't let anybody, what, uh, brainwash you, basically gaslight you whatever and tell you that there's something in the bible that makes it okay for us to treat black people this way um moses right you're supposed to defy the laws of egypt and get your get out of there to the promised land amos god's people have become come corrupt um at the lion building this quote is is carved into the to the stones in the lion building, all right? Or Micah, what does the Lord require of you? To do justly, to love mercy, uh, to follow humbly with your God, right? Okay, guys. So what I'm teaching you here is part of lion's mission. Um, continuing revelation within the Bible, the people who wrote it had different ideas of God and they change their ideas when the circumstances changed. So there's right at the beginning, there's the Yahweh author, the Jehovah author, the Deuteronomy author, Leviticus. I learned all this. I took a class in college. Then there's the, um, so there's the priestly tradition versus the prophetic tradition. There's two different kinds of prophets. I can't remember. My father was telling me that. Um, but when Jeremiah, okay, so the Jews dispersed, they were kicked out, and Jeremiah said, God will go with you. That was a different idea of God. When Noah um, thought, right, God wanted Noah to build an ark, he started out, he ran away, right? <laughs> he thought if he got far enough away from Israel that, you know, like, he would get out of God's range. <laughs> so he had a very physical view of where God was located. But the idea is that that's the way my father learned in seminary was, yeah, they, each of them has a different idea. So the punchline is you're going to have to work out your own idea. You might change your mind. Some of these guys changed their mind. Um, anyway, Jesus violated the Jewish laws, right? The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. He didn't want you to be slave to the rules. For example, there were some women, poor women, who were gathering when the, um, when the harvest came in. Not all of the machines, they weren't machines, but some wheat was left on the ground that hadn't been harvested because of the imprecise uh, mechanisms. So poor people would come and try to pick that wheat so that they could eat. And they were doing it on, on the Sabbath. And the rabbis were criticizing them for working on the Sabbath. And Jesus just said, that's terrible, right? I mean, the point of religion is to promote human dignity and well-being. It's not to judge people, especially when they're starving. So there's the spirit of the law and the letter of the law. Segregationist laws go against both the spirit and the letter. Um, Paul got in trouble, right? The Romans who oppressed the, 
the Christians. Um, let's see. Then there's a tradition of nonviolent resistance. Jesus was a nonviolent resistor. Paul was a nonviolent resistor. The early Christians, Gandhi, right? Um, my, Socrates, Socrates questioned the rulers. He didn't question the system, just like Martin Luther King is not questioning the federal laws. He's questioning the state laws. Um, he knew he was getting into trouble, but he was always dedicated to nonviolence. He accepted the punishment, just like Martin Luther King did. Um, Euthyphro quoted from the Bible to justify what he was doing, and Socrates was not a literalist. Same with Martin Luther King, right? He's not going to literally quote from every everything in the Bible, or, he, or we would still have slavery. Um, St. Augustine, St. Thomas, the only reasons to harm or kill are in self-defense. Uh, when someone attacks you, you've tried to, to negotiate, war is the last resort. So Martin Luther King argues that these demonstrations were the last resort. They had tried to negotiate, but they were acting in self-defense. They're getting attacked. Um, those who kill African-Americans unjustly should be punished. So this time it was, it's the police officers. Uh, the legal system should be designed to punish them um, rather than people taking the law into their own hands because that would create chaos. So you want to change the system. In Martin Luther King's case, it just apply the federal laws in Black Lives Matter case, it was um, to, to apply the federal laws, but the deferred immunity law was, and the way the Supreme Court took stuff into um, address some cases was really outrageous. I read it and I posted it if you wanna see it about deferred immunity, for example, a police officer killed a black guy and he was, um, the conditions were something like, I don't know, the usual. And the deferred immunity said, if the police officer didn't necessarily know this was illegal, then he doesn't suffer any consequences. And the Supreme Court decided that the police officer didn't know it was illegal. Oh my God, the Supreme Court should not be protecting the rich like that. But our Supreme Court right now has a reputation for protecting the rich and powerful. And that is going to happen. And if you keep up with it, you're going to notice. Um, Aristotle and segregationist laws. Okay. Um, Oh, let's see, just distribution of social goods, that's unfair, rectification of wrongs, the Blacks get punished more, um, the applying a law to a given situation, the Blacks get, um, the applications are racist, um, and then Seneca, the Roman law, Augustine, eternal law, Aquinas, natural law, um, divine law and natural law, or the old law of the Old Testament, the new law, and here's the letter. So, um, so I do want you to, I, I do think you need to recognize there are religious denominations that are social justice based. And, um, you know, I think it's unfortunate I don't think in the 25 years I've been to Lyon, I, well, we've had very few students go on to be ministers. And I can think of maybe five that went to Presbyterian seminaries. And that's just really unfortunate because, you know, you want to take your family to church on Sunday, maybe. I mean, I did because that was the once a week all the other chaos, you know, we got, we come together, we meet these people and 
the point of seeing them is they are virtuous people, they are good people, they are trustworthy people, right? And so my kids can see my husband and I interacting with all these good people. <laughs> I mean, it's amazing how during the week everything gets so scattered. You don't even, you don't have any gathering like that where you take some time out. And, um, and you need a good sermon, right? You need a sermon that says we have to keep loving our neighbor. We have to follow the golden rule, right? But if you have a sermon that says something like, those liberals are corrupt and they're evil. I mean, can you imagine a kid growing up with that week after week? It's, it's unnerving. So Mia, did you go to church where they said stuff like that or? Oh, yes, ma'am. I, so I have bounced around from a lot of churches because my family also just doesn't really agree with like a lot of the things that we, we don't we don't like intense stuff like that being said but um yeah I went I was Methodist well I still technically am um then we went Southern Baptist then we went Church of Christ I believe and now we're non-denominational but yeah definitely have had that experience <laughs> it's very I don't know yeah so Methodism I didn't go to the church in Batesville. It's just way too different. Um, there's different seminaries. There's different whatever. Um, so just just FYI, right? Um, there are Christian humanists. There are Christian social justice tradition. And then there's Christian anti-humanists. Remember we were talking about last time? Mm -hmm. um, so... I do, I do want you to spend some time thinking about it, writing about it, because you're going to have people talking to you in ways, right? And they're going to be using these words in ways that you're trying to figure out where the heck are they coming from, right? And, then, and the polarization is just awful. And for your sake, 20 years from now, you're going to have to take over the country. And if people are at each other's throats like that, how can you govern at all, you know? And so, um, so I hope, you know, you take some time with the material in the hope that you can build bridges between people. Um, let's see. Then this, let's see. Okay, this one was just a short letter where she, um, you know, she tries to briefly talk about institutionalized racism, structural racism, but what's this one? Oh, okay. So here's something that I, I think I've said this before. I vote for people on the basis of who the president will appoint to the cabinet. So this is, President Trump appointed to the public educational system to run our public educational system. A woman who is a billionaire, a billionaire's daughter, married to a billionaire, grew up in strict Calvinist religious schools, knows nothing about the public school, right? And then you find out that um, she is not, her, her recommendations for funding the CARES Act, she figured out how to get private schools to be able to get some of that money. And so the public schools in Michigan had to sue her. Um, she, she did a lot of things to destabilize the public schools, which are the kids that don't have, have the least, all right? Even in the midst of COVID, she's willing to do that. It's hard to take. <laughs> and then this one is um, that list of books, but I just wanted to talk about the color of law. So um, in the, in the, that short letter about institutionalized racism. 
I don't remember. Did I talk to you about the color of law, about what I learned from that book? Okay, because it's embarrassing to me that I'm like 66 years old before I read a book about this. Um, it's just about housing, okay? So all of us, I think, have some stereotypes, some idea in our head of those ghettos, you know, and we think, okay, you know, I'm not gonna judge. These cities have ghettos, they're toxic environments. Obviously kids shouldn't be growing up there. The schools are bad, the housing's bad. That's where a lot of these killings take place. Um, there's a lot of animosity. There's such a concentration of wealth and animosity. Um, in Minneapolis, it's like the third uh, division, like there's a certain district or precinct, third precinct, everybody knows about it. In Little Rock, there's a certain areas, everybody knows about them. Okay, how did that happen? Uh, okay, <laughs> we'll run through the whole thing, right? First, they get forced over here as slaves, then they get uh, slavery ends, but they're sharecropping. And, they, and a lot of them starve to death. I mean, this is not a chance, right? They can't, they can't get loans. They can't get, um, they can't get the advantages that white people got, 40 acres and a mule. Um, when they did start to succeed uh, on Juneteenth, what was that in Oklahoma? They got bombed. All right, there's a whole history of whenever they start succeeding, bomb, right? Then there was reconstruction, then the Jim Crow laws were passed. Then, um, then a number of blacks moved out of the South. They came North because they thought it would be better. It was not better or they went West. Everywhere they went, they were discriminated against. There's a book about that called, I think, the House of a Thousand Sons or something. But anyway, that's what that's about. Okay, so they come and they're only allowed to live in certain areas, right? And they're only allowed certain jobs and they get paid less. And then World War I hits. There's jobs over there in California for the shipping industry. They go out there. They can't get the jobs white people get. Um, they, so World War One, then World War Two, same thing. They go out, they try to get these jobs. They can't get these jobs. Um, okay, so I think it was World War One that they couldn't get the jobs. They got the worst jobs. First, it was white men that got the jobs. Then it was white women that got the jobs. Then, the, then it was black men, then it was black women. They didn't get the housing. Um, there was housing projects were built for white people. All those housing projects, government funded projects, most government funded housing was made for white people. Okay, it was made over in San Francisco, all these places. So the value after the war, the value of those houses started going up. Everybody knows housing in California costs incredible amount of money, all right? Then they could sell their house for a profit, buy a house in the burbs, you know, have this loan where part of the loan goes into the principal of the house. And you can ask your parents, part goes to the bank for the loan, but part goes for the principal. So you build equity. My family's wealth is based on equity. Most middle-class people's wealth is equity. African Americans never had a chance to live in houses where they had amortized loans so that it built up equity. If they missed one payment in like 10, 15 years, the bank took their house and they had nothing, okay? Then they couldn't buy houses in neighborhoods where the value of the house goes up. Okay, when I the house I lived in in Minneapolis, it went up $15,000 a year, every year in value, and you didn't do anything. 
So you pay on the mortgage, you build your principal there, you're making money there. Then the equity goes up. I mean, you're making 25,000 bucks a year on your house. And maybe you pay real estate tax a couple thousand, right? It's no comparison. And the real estate tax is paying for schools so that your kids have decent schools. So what happened? So then it used to be that states, every state, a certain amount of money for every student. Then the Supreme Court upheld a choice where local communities paid their real estate taxes paid for the public schools. Well, so your house is worth a lot. You have a lot of taxes. You have really good public schools, right? Then you have all the people living in the ghetto. Their house isn't worth much. They have no, they don't pay taxes and the schools are terrible, right? So then, then you have another thing. They had, they had areas where they lived and they had housing. And those, there was a neighborhood in St. Paul called the Rondo neighborhood. Then all over the whole country, interstate highways were deliberately built that cut right through those African-American neighborhoods to demolish the neighborhood. You guys, is that then after World War II, um, people fought, African-Americans fought in the war. And after that was called the GI Bill, which was mentioned in that one letter. My dad, you know, was on the GI Bill. That's how he got to go to a small liberal arts college. Because if you get into a college, whatever college you got in, you got to go to the college. The government would pay, which is very good because then you get a bunch of educated people who can get jobs, right, when they come back from the war. So they got college education and they got housing in the suburbs. But they couldn't get housing in the center of the city because it was dangerous. <laughs> so... There's no decent housing. Nobody lives in the center. So once again, they have all this crappy housing. Then black people, even when they fought in the war, they did not get any of those GI Bill benefits. They did not get a free college education. They did not get a decent house. And then we go, oh, they live in the ghettos. You guys, is anybody outraged yet? So why weren't they included on the GI Bill? Because they're black. <laughs> okay. And the guy who wrote this book said, look, you know, they should have reparations, right? There should be some kind of payback for this. Well, then some of them tried to move to the suburbs. And literally, these real estate brokers would... Um, First of all, if a few black people came in, of course, the white people were just furious and wanted them out because it was going to lower the value of their house, right? And so they had what's called redlining. And real estate people could not show black people a house if it was on the other side of the red line. I lived in a neighborhood like that. Um, so, so then... Um, the redlining. So there's a guy named Cory Booker, who's a senator, and his dad wanted to buy a house in the burbs so he could grow up there. And there were some activists involved in the neighborhood, and they went and they, they said, you know, Fred Booker wants to buy this house, and they got all the arrangements made. And another guy was there and all this stuff. And the price was set. And so they agreed to drive up and sign the contract. And then Cory Booker's dad appears and he's black. And if the real estate guy would not have sold it, it would have been against the law. He would have a lawsuit on his hands. But he was so mad because he was gonna lose his job because he sold the house to a black guy. He actually hit the guy in the face, right? He got into a punching match with him. But that's recent. This guy's not old. And um, 
let's see, there was there was another piece of the, that's only housing, you guys, only housing. What about, and then that gets tied to education, right? What about healthcare? That's a whole nother story. Uh, what about getting a job? That's a whole nother story. You guys, it's bad. <laughs> and I was surprised, right? So all I'm saying is just whatever appears and whatever things people say, just step back and say, this is such a long story, right? It's a 400 year story. You could dedicate your whole life to just working on racism and housing. Oh yeah, the real estate people, what they did when a few black people moved in, they would put up signs, the hordes are coming, the value of the house is gonna go down, sell your house right now. And people sold at low, less than the price. And then the real estate guys would sell to the black people at above the price and they made tons of money, right? Uh, I don't know. Is anybody breathing fire yet? Um, so that's all. My punchline is please, if somebody says there's no problem with institutional racism, just say, um, I don't think so. Um, and and it be really, it's really hard to solve. It's really hard to solve. And I feel and I feel for police officers who really, I mean, they've been a lot of them have been in the war. They have PTSD, and so they get a job at a job that's going to trigger them. You know. Anyway, it's just a long haul to figure out how to solve these problems because it was 400 years to make them what they are. Um, but what I would hope is that you would decide in my generation, I would like my generation to be putting us on a better path. Does that make sense? That's not utopia. It's just not committing suicide. <laughs> okay, we'll see you next time. You pick your own kind of humanism, okay? Bye, Dr. Beck. Bye-bye.